Hey everybody and welcome to episode 88 of How I Built It. Today, we're talking to Bryce Adams, creator of one of my favorite tools, Metaric. Bryce tells us about the path that led him to making Metaric, his views on e-commerce, GDPR, and how he's using some cutting edge tools. We'll get to all of that and more, but first, I want to tell you about a new podcast I have coming out this week called Creator Toolkit. If this show is where we talk to the carpenters of the world, Creator Toolkit is the show that tells you which hammer you should use. We'll talk all about how to build specific types of projects and how to make certain decisions when building on the web. The first episode drops Thursday, August 9th, and covers how to choose between hosted and self-hosted solutions. If you stick around until the end, I've included a short preview. This week's episode is brought to you by Creator Courses and Pantheon. We'll hear all about Pantheon a little bit later. Creator Courses is a website dedicated to teaching you how to build on the web. Their catalog of courses continually grows, and it's becoming the best place to learn how to build specific projects with task-based objectives. You will always learn by doing. Currently, you can learn how to use the new WordPress editor with the Introduction to Gutenberg course. You may have seen the notification to try it in the latest WordPress update. This course will teach you everything you need to take full advantage. Head over to buildpodcast.net slash Gutenberg and use the code BUILDIT at checkout for 40% off. And now on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of How I Built It, the podcast that asks, how did you build that? Today, coming all the way from Melbourne, Australia, am I saying that right, is Bryce Adams of Metaric. Bryce, how are you today? Hello. Hello. I am really good. And it's, (laughs) I feel very spoiled to get to do a podcast interview at like 11 a.m. my time. So (laughs) thank you for meeting me late on your. Oh, no problem. I, you know, when my my wife is a night shift nurse and so once the baby goes to bed, I'll, uh, I'll get a, you know, an hour or so of extra work in around that time. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's my pleasure. I'm glad we were able to sync up. Yeah, me too. I'm always careful to say Melbourne the right (laughs) way. Because my brother <laughs> lives in lived yeah. in Melbourne, Florida, and Florida, yeah. yeah. <laughs> everyone, I think everyone in Melbourne knows Melbourne, Florida. Like everyone in Melbourne, Australia knows Melbourne, Florida, <laughs> because it's like, especially when we talk to anyone from America, I don't know you say like, "Oh, I'm from Melbourne." If they don't hear your accent, maybe like you're typing it or something like that. They're like, oh, Melbourne, Florida. Like, yeah, I'm close. So, <laughs> oh, I went there once. <laughs> so it's it's so strange to me, like, because it's I never, I've never been. I don't even know what's going on in there. But there's, I know it so well. Yeah, there's a, there's a college that's younger than my dad, and that's and that's about it. That, <laughs> Sounds like a great place. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. It, you know, it's nice. Uh, it's about an hour from Disney World, but. That's interesting because oh, you you know when he said I'm going to Melbourne I'm like oh you're going to Australia for college and he's like <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he uh, he quite. became <laughs> he became friends with somebody from Australia and they they corrected our pronunciation so I'm always mindful to say yeah. it the right way <laughs> you did it perfectly I was just thinking though it would be quite challenging as someone from Melbourne to go and study at that college in Melbourne, Florida. Just thinking of the conversations I'd have and be like, oh, it's nice to meet you. Where are you from? <laughs> I'm from Melbourne. Like, oh, you don't sound like it. Uh, That'd be pretty fun. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the best, the closest thing we have near me is, is there's a Moscow, Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. Yeah, so not nearly <laughs> as cool as Moscow, Russia. <laughs> but uh, t- today, so that's everybody's geography lesson for the day. Uh, yeah. Today we're going to be talking about a tool that uh, I've been using for a while that I'm a huge fan of called Metaric. But uh, so Bryce, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I'm I'm Bryce. My background is. Well, I don't know. I used to make some, I was traveling for a while. I was like nomadic. And then I got into the WordPress world, made some uh, plugins, some eventually, a lot of them were free. And then eventually I I made a couple that were paid ones on Code Canyon. That was my first like foray into making money from coding. Nice. So it was really cool uh, and challenging. <laughs> <laughs> and then I uh, ended up getting a job over at Woo. This is back in, I don't know, it's probably, I'm trying to, I always forget the years, like 2014. And I was doing uh, support for WooCommerce. So really 
kind of challenging but valuable experience for me. It was my first like time really doing WordPress and working with WordPress and coding as a career. So yeah, I really enjoyed that time. And then eventually we joined Automatic. So kind of did the same thing there, but eventually I ended up leaving and that was back in 2016 and started to build this product metric, which is, I always struggle to describe it, which is awful. But <laughs> these days I'm, because it's, it's, it's changed so much from what I like, what in my head I would describe it as before. But these days I kind of describe it as like a co-pilot for WooCommerce stores. So anyone running a WooCommerce e-commerce store, it's kind of there just to help them with all the things that they can't do through WooCommerce itself. And also a lot of things that maybe they never thought to do with WooCommerce. So it starts with things like just reports, but then goes further and lets you like segment your data. So finding customers that haven't ordered in a while or trying to figure out what your like highest selling products are, all those kinds of things. And then I kind of kept taking it further than I originally planned and started doing things like integrations. So I had uh, an integration with Zendesk and then Help Scout and then a few other support platforms and then Google Analytics. And more recently, a big focus of mine has been on something I'm calling Metric Engage, which you might have even played with yourself, uh, Joe, but it's like email automation for WooCommerce stores, but made really simple, but still really, really powerful. So th my advantage there is that I've leveraged this segmenting system I built for Metric that I kind of describe it as like an infinite segmenting system. But the idea is you you have all your data, your orders, your customers, and then in Metric, you can say, okay, well, show me all the orders that, you know, from a city like one of these cities and was for this amount and had these products and you can just stack as many rules as you want. But with Engage, the idea is, okay, now that you've segmented those orders or those customers or even those uh, WooCommerce subscriptions, let's email those customers automatically. So for me, that's a pretty exciting uh, direction I'm kind of heading in now. Yeah, that sounds great. And we'll, uh, we'll totally dive into that because it sounds super interesting. But uh, the, I mean, I think the way you described it is naturally really good. Uh, you're the founder, <laughs> so what? What, You'd hope so. what, <laughs> <laughs> what drew me to it was, I mean, I think so. WooCommerce is is free. It's a free e-commerce platform. Yeah. But I think the one one of the big things it's lacking as like a big boy e-commerce platform is reporting. There's not a whole lot mm -hmm. built into it. So yeah. I had I heard of this from Brian Krogsgaard, who says that you know he like raves about it, and and I signed up a little while ago, and I wasn't doing that well with sales, so I'm like I don't I can't really justify, you know I don't think I need yeah, reports for, sure. for like five the five customers I have, but uh, <laughs> this year it's a lot better for me. Awesome! Yeah. Well, congrats, <laughs> congrats to you for yeah, that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. And so like one day I was just like bouncing around WooCommerce or yeah WooCommerce, and I was like I need to. I need to figure out how many people from Pennsylvania have bought my product because in Pennsylvania you yeah. still need to pay the tax sales tax stuff, right? right on digital yeah, products exactly. And I couldn't do it. I'm like, all right, well, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do <laughs> metric. Like, I'm just gonna do that now. Yeah, pay for the year, totally worth it. So yeah, I well, I appreciate it. I think it's interesting you mentioned that because that's the idea. It's like a lot of people say to me, well, what do I do with it? And I'm like. Either that means you're kind of getting started and your store is, doesn't have that much data and that's totally okay. Like, I don't feel like metrics a product every single WooCommerce store should have. A lot of my customers feel like that but <laughs> and I appreciate that. But then, of course, when you're doing a few orders a month, there just isn't as much value you can get out of it. And perhaps you can get a little bit, but I can't guarantee to them they're going to get the price of the subscription out of it. And I don't do anything for free just because we can talk about that later, but it's something that I've kind of struggled with to accept since it kind of compromises the sustainability of the product so i always say to people like i don't want you to pay for it if it's not worth it for you i'm not trying to like be the winner here and make more money than like to get the better end of the deal right i want it to be like i want a customer to feel like it's a win-win situation well of course i'm winning because i'm getting a customer and revenue but they're winning because they're saving so much of their time like you ran into that issue like i want you to if it saves you even just an hour of time that's probably worth it at least just for the month so that's kind of my <laughs> approach to it all. yeah without a doubt and that's exactly how i justified it i'm like you know i could either dig through or find some you know maybe less than reputable plugin to do this one yeah. thing for me <laughs> this one time or i can i can pay for the year and save myself time now and around tax time yeah. and just like saving my time around tax time is is going to be clutch for me like i can send this to my accountant and be like run, run whatever reports you want you know yeah and that's the thing everyone everyone wants to do things differently and i get asked a lot where 
someone might struggle at first using metric because it might be a little overwhelming for them. And I say, well, I could just make all those decisions for you. And I've always, I've even done like talks at WordCamps about making decisions, not options for customers. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big believer in that. But I think running an e-commerce store, an actual business online is so much different to like a simple plugin that I install on someone's site, um, like for adding a contact form or something like that. Like for me, an e-commerce store, your store is like the heart of your business. So I don't want to just make all these decisions for you and pretend like I know exactly what you want and how you want to get it. For me, I, I want to give you that flexibility while still, of course, guiding you there and saying, okay, these are the numbers that I think are important. But if you feel otherwise, that's totally okay. You can figure out whatever numbers you want. You can segment however your data however you want. It's your data. Like that's totally okay. So that's kind of my approach there. That's fantastic. And uh, yeah, you totally mentioned decisions and the options. That's like part of the WordPress development mantra or yeah. their prin- their development principles. But uh, you're right. I mean, you know, you're running some, you know, somebody like me that's only digital products or there's people who are selling Ooh. physical stuff that might need more information. And, 100%. Yeah. They need different data. And, and it's not like I can just do to I can make decisions for you guys separately. Like it's not just the digital products and the physical ones, but then, okay, the physical ones, they might have subscriptions. And then some of those physical ones that have subscriptions also have a digital element to it. And yeah, but that's the beauty of WooCommerce and WordPress and why we all use it. It's not because WordPress makes these decisions for us. It's the complete opposite. It gives us the, that freedom. So I, I kind of want to take a leaf out of WordPress's book there and WooCommerce's book there and kind of give people the freedom to to get the numbers that matter to them. Yeah, that, yeah that's 100%. I think that's incredible. So... You left Automatic in 2016. How did you, like, what gave you the idea for this product or this this service? Yeah, well, my advantage, I guess, was that I was, like, talking to not even hundreds, thousands of WooCommerce stores every month, and especially because my job was WooCommerce support. I didn't start in uh, development. I kind of grew into that. But, yeah, I started by just talking to customers and them telling me the problems they were having. Back in, back in, End of 2014, 2015, I think it would have been when this is way before automatic. I kind of had that idea and I was still in support, but I'd been learning to program on the side and been making a few plugins here and there. So I felt confident enough to, to kind of take a crack at it and, and make something really simple, but that kind of solved the problem I was trying to solve in, which was a lack of reports and, and KPIs, like just knowing what's your average order value. Like that wasn't something that you could easily find at the time. And so I, I built something like a really rough beta back then and. I uh, kind of pitched it to the to the Woo team, but it wasn't really a good fit at the time and it kept getting delayed. And then, you know, I started doing development there as my job. So my spare time, like I didn't really want to spend doing more development all the time. So I, I kind of just, I forgot about it as well. But then, yeah, slowly over time, as we joined Automatic and I kind of realized no one, at least from our side, was interested in doing it. I just thought, okay, this is something I really want to do. Like I, I've got the idea, <laughs> that's pretty much it, but... I'm confident that I can I can build something that could create that value and for me and for customers. But yeah, definitely a really, really tough decision and, and a lot easier to look at it in hindsight and, and say, okay, it was the right decision. But at the time, I really wasn't sure because especially in the WordPress world, working at Automatic is kind of considered like the best job uh, you can yeah, have you made by it. a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. like Of course, there are so many amazing other companies that I would in a, in a second, be happy to work for in the WordPress or like human made and even, you know, what Pippin's doing, Easy Digital Downloads, mm-hmm. Sandhills. So there are so many of these great companies to work for. But at least for me, like working at Automatic, it wasn't, I wasn't wishing for another company to work for. Mm-hmm. I wasn't thinking about, yeah, that. So it was really like tough to do, but I kind of just said, okay, I want to do this. I'm fortunate that I'm young, didn't, don't have kids, have a, have a dog. <laughs> so it's kind of a little responsibility there. But I, I did feel like I was in a position where it was possible. And so I kind of just said, okay, how long, how long will it take me to build it? How long will it take me to get that first customer? How long will it take me, importantly, to not replace my salary in automatic, which that was not the goal at the start. But how long will it take me to break even, to, to live like the life I'm living right now? Yeah, without like deep dipping into my savings and kind of set a budget and timeline and and said like, okay, if it doesn't work out, I think it was, I left like around August, September, 2016. So I think I said, okay, I've got till like March or April, 2000 and it would have been 17 mm-hmm. to get to the point of just breaking even. And then I didn't mind if I was like breaking even for another year after that, but at least get to that point right. where I can breathe. And yeah, I think 
anyone kind of in that situation is thinking of the same thing. Like, how can I get to the point where this is a sustainable activity and then I can worry about making a business and making money and, and benefiting from it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, and I, uh, I maybe picked self-employment at the exact wrong time from that perspective. I had, <laughs> I had a three-month-old at home. <laughs> but uh, That's hard. Yeah, yeah but it, I mean, it's also like, when when is the right time? Right, exactly. When they're six months, when they're a year? Yeah. yeah. It's just going to keep getting harder. Yep. So you take that risk. Yep. And I think at least the sooner the better. As long as, at least for me, I was just thinking, okay, like I've got the, the money there just to support me building this for a while. I'll just do it. And if it doesn't work out, I'll get a job. Like it's not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not giving up that much. And it's not, not that it's not like I'm really like struggling in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. And like my wife was incredible. She was very supportive. I said, you know, I've got basically six months to make it so that we're not dipping into our savings and uh, yeah. otherwise I'll find a job. Awesome. And it, uh, yeah, it's not the end of the world. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be like that uh, make it or break it thing. It can be just like, okay, try this. It doesn't work. I try a different job. And then I can try this again in a few years if I still want to do yeah, it. Absolutely. And then, so, you know, I, I I always like to ask about the research, but it sounds like you had a, a pretty nice gig, like built into your full time job doing research, talking to customers about their frustrations. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Definitely. And, and, I mean, probably the biggest disadvantage I had was that just at automatic, it wasn't really possible to do side projects like that. Right. So it's not like I could work on it in that, in that time when I was there, but ideas, you know, are something you can have and, and just kind of understanding the problems that people were having and, and thinking of ways to solve it definitely helped. But as I was kind of touching on before, and it's, it's funny how it worked out, but yeah, metric is so far from what at least that beta I built back in when was it 2014 15 like it's so far from that now <laughs> just because you know as you start you just it turns into something else based on customer feedback mm-hmm. and everything like that so yeah it's it's, it's funny because i don't think i ever researched what it is now but i definitely felt like i had some understanding going in of what i was starting to build yeah yeah that's great and i mean it's it's cool that you're you know flexible enough to to change it in ways that add a lot of value for your customers too so, so let's, yeah. you know, let's get into the title question. How did you build it? And I'm, <laughs> I'm very keen on this question because it sounds like, you know, I made mm-hmm. my first website like 15 years ago. I was in high school. I learned how to program. Like, yeah. uh, I've been programming yeah. for about that time, I guess, too. Yeah. And it sounds like you, within the last five years, learned how to write code. Is that accurate? <laughs> to some extent. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like I had my first WordPress site. A long time ago, I don't know, ten years. It was like a Mac news website. It was called It's All Mac. Nice. Nice. <laughs> uh, that was pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know even what version of WordPress it was, but yeah, back then I, I had to dabble with like changing the color of something, basic CSS, mm-hmm. or never really much further. I remember two thousand and when was it? Two thousand eleven. I think it was around then, or well, two thousand twelve. I kind of I was at starting university here and. I really, really hated it. Uh, and it was like in my first week and I had this idea, like how great would it be just for like a stack overflow kind of app, but for universities where you could like just join the community of your university and ask questions and answers. So <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll build that since I'm already here at uni. I've got like the, you know, envi- I'm in the right environment that I remember even back then I had, it was PHP. I was using some framework. I can't remember what it was called. Definitely not WordPress, something else, uh, but Oh man, I had no idea what I was doing. I remember just being so overwhelmed and so scared of like the concept of how to change things and writing PHP and just how it all worked. So yeah, I think I had a little bit of background with definitely with like CSS and, and, and basic stuff and understanding how the web works. But yeah, I would I definitely wasn't a very good programmer back then. But yeah, I ended up leaving university after that week. Oh, wow. <laughs> it didn't go very well. <laughs> yeah, I just I just couldn't do it, man. I tried, and I was like, no, I'll go travel for a bit. Came back, tried again. I think I lasted another week that time, and then I was just like, no, this is not working. So then, then I ended up doing that was uh, yeah 2012, and I ended up trying to learn more about WordPress and coding, and, and that's kind of where I started that journey. Yeah. Awesome. That's man. That's a yeah. very cool story. I totally did like the traditional. Well, thank you. I mean, I did you know four years of university and then I got my master's degree in software engineering. So I, yeah, I was very like academics, academics, and you know, and yeah, that was the right, I don't yeah. think there's a, there's any right or wrong right. way to do it, right? Yeah. That that worked for you. Maybe I'd be a much better programmer if I'd also done it that way. I think it's just the the, the person right who's they're doing it and like what 
what works for them, what's the best way for them to learn and for them to grow in other ways, not even just with programming, but as a person. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I mean, I think if I maintain the same mindset that I, I have now in 17 years, I'll tell my daughter, go to college or don't, you know, as long as you can yeah. do what you love or do what you want to do and support yourself, that's fine. Exactly. So. Yeah. It's also the world we're in where like there are, especially probably 10 years ago, I'm thinking back to when I was going to uni, I, I definitely felt a lot of pressure to go. Right. It wasn't like optional where people were like, yeah, you can go if you want. I remember back in school, like meeting with the kind of career counselors and they're trying to help you figure that out. It was never an option not to go to university. No one ever said, by the way, you don't have to go if you want. You can just kind of figure things out or travel. Of course, they're not, they can't recommend you that after in their position, but I suppose maybe in a few years or maybe you're already now, that's starting to change. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Here in the States, uh, I think that the next big bubble to burst is going to be higher education because it's so expensive. And now people are leaving yeah. the charge the for, loans yeah, and stuff. for trade schools. And I know so many pro. you know, I'll say that, yes, uh, getting a formal education in software engineering uh, has made me maybe a better software architect than a lot of my contemporaries starting out. But lots of people are self-taught. And if you find the right resources to self-teach, then that's fine too. You yeah. Know, so, but uh, man, so we're covering a lot of different life topics here. So, um, <laughs> how, so how did you build Metric? It's a very how did I nice build it? Yeah, looking, technically, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it looks really nice. Thank you. It, it seems very powerful, and and so yeah. you know, I'm very curious about your development stack. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Well, it's it's Laravel behind the scenes, which is pretty familiar now, I think, to a lot of WordPress people, just because. Yeah, it's it's a it's the biggest PHP framework in the world right now. It's amazing. The community is amazing. It's all open source, so it's a very similar feeling to what you get working in the WordPress world. I, I do feel like one thing I am missing out is that I haven't really gone to many Laravel conferences or or communicated a lot with the community there. Definitely my fault, just because I'm I'm building this product. I don't really have as much time as I used to when I was an employee at a company where I was right. you know, involved in the community. But I definitely see a lot of it just from building it and just being kind of on the outside and and it definitely has a lot of similarities to wordpress so laravel is behind the scenes it's like the php framework and then for the actual front end though like i don't really do anything with laravel there i've got like an api that metric will talk to so it'll say like similar to the wordpress api give me all the orders give me all the customers but on the front end it's all uh vue.js which is nice again maybe familiar Yeah. yeah but it's very very similar to react in that sense where it's a complete like UI framework that just gives you complete control over the reactivity of your app and building these really amazing UX experiences. And honestly, the stuff I'm building now, like I never even thought would be possible. It wasn't even a matter of, is it possible for me to build this? But I didn't even think technically it was possible. And yet I'm doing it now. And it's, it's honestly, it is easy with Vish.js. I'm not trying to be humble like with that. I'm just being honest. It is really, really simple. And I've taught it even to like a few people around me where they'll like ask about that and I'll kind of try to explain the concept to them. And in doing that, I, I even see again, like how uh, simple, but yet powerful it really is. Today's episode is brought to you by Pantheon. WordPress 5.0 and the new editor Gutenberg are coming. Are you prepared? Do you want to learn about the changes in advance? Pantheon has gathered resources to help you prepare including webinars and tutorials. Pantheon also has made it easy and free to try Gutenberg with your site before the official launch. Visit pantheon.io slash Gutenberg. Let them know that How I Built It sent you. And now, back to the show. Wow, that's that's awesome. I, you know, it's funny. I outlined the things I want to learn this year, and Laravel and Vue are both on my list of things to learn. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very happy yeah. to do that. So that's that's fantastic. So another question I like to ask the developers is like, what's your what's your environment? Like, are you like a Sublime guy or VS Code or whatever? <laughs> VS Code for sure. Yeah. That seems to yeah, I, that seems I, to be the the, the <laughs> increasingly popular, right? popular answer. I think I've gone through a few different ones while I built Metric. I'm thinking about now, and it feels like there's nothing before VS right. Code, but I I definitely only started with VS Code six months, nine months ago, something like that. Before that, I guess. I think I used to use PHP Storm, but then I'd also like, you know, everyone wants to go simple and use Sublime sometimes. Yeah. So I definitely switch between them. But these days, I can't even think of using anything but VS Code. Just an amazing product. So many great plugins for it. Like, it's just such a pleasure to work with. Yeah, it's it's so pretty and like works really well. And 
I was using Adam before yeah. that, and Adam was good, but it got oh, nice. it got bogged down a little bit too easily for me. Yeah. So cool. That's so VS Code. Yeah, love yeah. it. Yeah, and then what about your local development environment? You're not using, you know, I think the most common answer probably is local by Flywheel among WordPress people, but this is not a WordPress powered app. So are you doing, are you, you know, are you doing local development or? <laughs> no. Well, technically, I have used Flywheel. It really came in handy for testing. I was trying to just test. I've got a, there is a component of metric, which is a WordPress plugin, right. the metric helper plugin. Really, really lightweight. It's really just there to kind of improve the syncing of data and also to do some things like track where customers come from, how long they're spending on the site before checking out, those kinds of things. So I, I did use Flywheel's local recently just to test that plugin with different PHP environments. So right. with 5.2 and 5.4, amazing for that, just like to be able to spin up those environments that right. quickly and, and run it all for, at the same time as well. Like I'm running 5.2 and I'm running 7 and everything. Yeah, so that was really, and really like cool. you can just like change it on the fly too. Like if you like set up a custom yeah. environment, you can just yeah. change the version like right there on the fly. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I think... I kind of really wish I had that when I was doing WordPress plugins like every day back then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> but these days, yeah, for Laravel, like normally everyone's using, before it used to be Homestead, which was like a virtual box vagrant kind of thing. But these days I'm just using, it's called Laravel Valet okay. or Valet. It's really, really great because what it does is you don't actually create like a virtual environment or virtual box on your computer, but rather it's kind of just running the stuff needed to 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 power the app just on your computer. So you have just like MariaDB or whatever using MySQL. You're just running that on the Mac, normally using Homebrew. But it's so easy to set up. And the best thing is I don't have to tweak it at all. I never even think about it. When you ask me, I kind of had to stop and think for a second <laughs> just because it's not, yeah, it's honestly not something that's part of my day-to-day -day anymore. While with Vagrant and stuff, I felt like every week I was searching how to fix some problem oh, and yeah. then waiting an hour for something to happen. Yeah, nightmare. So... Oh, it's, a, it's a really, really nice experience. Don't get me wrong. I do run into issues occasionally. It's normally more like when there's a big OSX update, mm -hmm. there'll be something that messes up the configuration for it or how Nginx handles things. But uh, normally you can just solve it by reinstalling it. And because it's so quick, there's no setting up a virtual environment. You can like try a whole different like, bunch of solutions really, really quickly. Awesome. So I'm going to ask this because it's timely as we record this and people will probably be yeah, yeah. well sick of it by the time this episode comes out. But you mentioned you have <laughs> the right. helper plugin and it's, it's sending data to your app. How have yeah, you yeah, been yeah. affected by GDPR? GDPR. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you I saw totally it telegraphed that question. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's a great question. Uh, definitely something really relevant to metric and something that I did have to invest quite a lot of time into like everyone else but also saying that i didn't have to invest as much time into because i've always built metric from the start as being privacy centric privacy focused and and really trying to respect not just my users privacy but their customers mm -hmm. because an interesting thing is that i'm not just what typically every story is which is a data controller but i'm also a data processor in that i'm processing your data and the data of anyone using metric so there are different responsibilities there and different ways to handle things. But uh, fortunately, it's not as much work as you think because it's not like I'm, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Okay, it's not like I'm a coding app or an invoicing app where I've got all your data that's sensitive to your store um, or to your business and everything like that. Really, Metric doesn't have too much data about individuals, like about you. It's just, you know, your name and your email and things like that, the, the general stuff. But then most of the data is your actual store's data, which I process, don't control. So a lot of things are taken care of just through how WooCommerce handles the data, especially with the WooCommerce uh, 3.4 latest release that added that G GDPR compliance. So little things like, you know, removing customers' details no problem, it'll remove them in metric. Delete a customer, they get deleted in metric. So yeah, it, it, it hasn't been that difficult uh, to comply, but it's also, it's been really just insightful to kind of see the impact it's having on the industry and, and kind of, to, for me, I, I'm really got a lot out of it because I've improved my privacy policy that's been completely revamped, which everyone's doing, <laughs> sending the email to everyone, you know, I got a new privacy policy update. But it is something that, I think everyone kind of knows that feeling when you're starting a product, especially like on your own and you're bootstrapping it, you are not going to go spend $10,000 on lawyers right. or, yeah. or yeah, invest all this time in worrying about your terms of service, how, how the words are formed. And if you're using the right grammar and things like that, it's just, that's not how you build a sustainable bootstrapped company at the start. So 
it was really nice to have a chance to revisit that now where I have the resources and try to improve it. Yeah, that's that's a really great point. It did make me revisit a few things. Luckily, the, I use mostly WordPress tools and they've made it easy to be at least as GDPR compliant as I'm willing to be as a stubborn American. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, fair outside enough. Outside <laughs> of, the, of yeah. the EU. But yeah, yeah, so I was just, you know, you are, you know, you made it into my privacy policy. You know, I'm like, I send data to Metric, but. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of the extent of it. And then for me, like one of the things that I found really helpful, and I think a lot of, I saw a lot of similar products do the same, is just to make like a GDPR help doc or page where it just kind of says, yeah, these are how we're tackling all the things. So I answered a lot of like frequently asked questions. Of course, I'm not really getting asked by American stores, but I've got a lot of European customers. So I was getting asked every day. So I just said like, yeah, no worries. Don't worry. I'm compliant. I'm on board. Here are some of the answers that you're looking for. Basically, everyone wants to know where, what the, the like the sub processor who I'm sharing data with, and it's really easy for me because I don't share it with anyone. Like, of course, there's no reason I I don't need to, and I won't. Like, for example, I've got something you've probably seen with Metric where it's like a global search, mm-hmm. and then there's like just general searching where you can just type in a name and find all the orders or customers yeah. or products that match it. It could be a lot faster if I use something like Algolia. I'd love sure. to. It would be like really really fast. Besides, for the cost reasons, I don't feel comfortable with the idea of sending not just my customer's data, but my customer's customer's data to these third parties. So I've just tried to build everything in-house. I don't even back up like like store actual customer data to external services. Of course, I've got you know a bunch of backups and stuff in place, but my, my focus is more on backing up the metric data. Right. I can always get the data from your store again. I can always sync with your store and get everything. If you're a small store in a couple of minutes, if you're a big store, maybe a few hours. I'm willing to... To say to you, I'm sorry, but you have to wait a few hours for that data to come in. If it was a catastrophic, you know, failure, and I have to know, go and get it from your store again, I'm okay doing that if it means that your data doesn't touch a third party. So for me, that's like yeah, a priority. Yeah, but it's made GDPR easy. Yeah, that's uh, that's fantastic. And you know, I mean, as a store owner, it gives me peace of mind, right? Because you're not you're not taking my my data and then selling it off to somebody else or giving it to somebody. Yeah, else. no, no, no. That's yeah. my my nightmare. I, I, of course, if metric was free. I don't know how else you'd make it sustainable. Like businesses, if you're not free, you're the product. There's all, yeah, there's that. Exactly. if you're not paying, you're the right. product. If you're right. not paying, you're the yeah. product, right? And that's for sure. Right. When all that Cambridge Analytica stuff <laughs> came out about Facebook, they're like, I'm, I was shocked more at how shocked people yeah. were. I'm like, what did you think? Yeah. Facebook's exactly. a billion yeah, dollar you, company. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, how do you think? For sure. <laughs> Man. Yeah. So, well, so, so we're like, we're at the end of the conversation, you know, I, I try to keep these episodes about a half hour long, and this one has been a lot of fun talking about um, all sorts of different stuff. <laughs> yeah, I've had fun, man. So we've talked about, you know, where you've been, so uh, I'll end with, you know, yeah. the two questions I always end with, which is, uh, the first one is, yeah, yeah. Uh, what are your plans for the future? Uh huh. So, kind of trying to figure that out now, like, a big part for the last few months has been just worrying about getting engaged, which is that email automation product live, especially because it's, it's an add-on product, so... Before metric was just like there was one price depending on how many orders you had, but now there's two. It's a little bit extra if you want to send like unlimited emails through Engage, and a lot of people are using it now, and that's been like an amazing feeling just to kind of ship that, get people paying for it. And now I'm starting to think, okay, what do I do next? So <laughs> I don't have an amazing answer for you, but in general, I just have the longest to do list in the world of just ideas and feedback from customers and things I need to work on. Some of the things I'm going to be adding soon are like specifically to engage like uh, cart recovery emails everyone's asking for. And yeah, some of those kind of things. Just I want to just keep leveraging the platform I'm building with Metric. I I don't know if you call it a platform, but the product and and just kind of take it further and just keep making it easier for my uh, customers to run their stores and make money and to grow their businesses. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So actually, so let's talking about engage real quick. Uh-huh. Let's make the distinction, right? Because you said you have the engage emails and then you're working on like the card abandonment emails. So would engage be more akin to like the WooCommerce follow up emails plugin that's there? Like someone places an order and yeah. they get like the four emails that WooCommerce generates, but you can customize it, right? And say like, hey, thanks for buying this product, this and that, you know, and, and uh, stuff like that. It's very similar to that one for sure. But more so in that it's more than like it's also just saying okay well like i want to contact customers when they haven't ordered in a while or Mm. with subscriptions i want to email them a week before their next payment i've got a lot of customers that use WooCommerce subscriptions and charge their customers a large amount a few hundred dollars every year 
They don't want to just charge them. They want to email like a week before. But also if the customer cancels, they want to follow up and say, like, can we get you back? Here's a coupon. It's, yeah, it's hard to describe it as like doing one thing because the approach I've taken with leveraging this like infinite segmenting system I have is people are coming up with these crazy like approaches to using it and it's making their money. And I didn't even think of it. Like some people use it for getting reviews, but then some people just using it for like telling people about relevant products. I just had never really thought of all the ways that they would use it. And so for me, it's just really amazing to see what people come up with. And I'm trying to do more on my end to like kind of write about the different ways to use it because I only know what I can think of, but customers are thinking of all these different ways. I want to make it easy for other customers to use those similar methods, but the cart stuff and anything else I do is all going to fall under this umbrella of engage where it's about engaging with your customers or potential customers and trying to, you know, provide them with your product and your service and, and grow your store with them. So it's, yeah, it's, I don't think it's just going to be that there's other things I want to do under that umbrella yeah. for sure. That's fantastic. So for, for those of you who are listening to this episode, but have not listened to the, most recent Chris Lemma episode on managed WooCommerce hosting, he talks about the importance of segmentation and connecting with your customers, right? So uh, the example he gives, which yeah. sounds like a perfect use case for, for Metrics Engage, which uh, is, you know, you have customers, you have repeat customers, maybe they buy a new product every 127 days. That's the number that he gave. Exactly. You don't want to hit yeah. that customer with, uh, hey, you bought this. Why don't you also buy this a week later, right? That's like, you know, you're using kind of no, like a dumb sense. segmentation system there. But y- if you know that, hey, every 127 days they buy something on day 127 or day 126, you could say, hey, here's a little coupon. Go Go buy something else in the store. Yeah, for sure. Or you can even like take that and try to think, okay, well, if I know it's 120 days, how can I lower that to 100? Yeah. Maybe I email like the month before, but give them a coupon. So now I'm, I'm giving up a little value with the small 10% or whatever discount, but they're ordering more frequently. So yeah, that's kind of how it started with metric. Cause I had, I have the, that data. It's so easy to see. Okay. What's your average time between orders? And, and you can segment and say, what's my average time between orders just for customers from Pennsylvania or just for customers that bought this product as their first product. So you can kind of see all that, but then people kept saying, well, okay, I've got that data, but now I need to use it. I want to contact them. So that's kind of how Engage happened. Very cool. Very cool. And awesome. Well, I will certainly, I, I took a <laughs> cursory look at it, but now I, un- I actually understand. Now I have a lot more context of why it's important for me. So I'm definitely going to take a look at it now. And awesome. uh, I want to ask you my favorite question, which is, do you have any yeah. trade secrets for us? <laughs> I'm figuring it out, but no, I've, I've got, I've got... One bit of advice, I guess, there. And it's just something I see just having gone from kind of starting this and, and being at that early stage to now, I feel like I built something I'm, I'm quite proud of and is successful in, in that sense. So I do feel I always hesitant to give advice because I, I don't like the idea of telling people what they should do like I know better. But it's just one thing I do see a lot, especially in the software as a service world, is probably just don't take things too seriously at the start. Don't like worry so much about the perfecting things that don't matter. Like really when you're starting at least a software as a service or any kind of product, a software product, just ship it and get revenue and then iterate and talk to customers. Like, so I see, see so many people that are working on products for like a year before they're like selling it. And I'm sorry, that's just way too long. Mm-hmm. Like it, it shouldn't, when I launched metric, of course it was much far worse than it is now. It didn't do like a quarter of the things it does now. It had bugs. It had all these problems, but I still got customers because they noticed and recognized the value in it. And a lot of them were just supporting me even. It was of value to them, but also they wanted to see what it would become. So they were happy to support me in those early days. And if I hadn't launched, maybe it would have all failed. So I can't stress that enough. Like just put something live and and get feedback and you can always improve something, but you can't. You can't like recover that time you've lost if you wait too long. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you're starting something out, I think the thing that I always got stuck on was like, is it scalable? Can it scale to like a million people? I don't have a million people yeah. yet. Like, I'll just doesn't matter. Let me let exactly. it scale it to five people and then ten people. For sure. And also, you've got to think what's relevant for your the business you're trying to build. And with Metric, I knew like my average customer would be paying fifty to a hundred US a month. Like, there's some a little bit lower, and there's some a lot higher. Some people pay me six hundred. 
So I kind of knew, okay, if I'm making between 50 and 100, how many customers do I need to be at the point where I'm breaking even? How many customers do I need to have my old salary? How many customers do I need to be making more money than I know what to do with? You can have those numbers. And I promise you those numbers are going to be lower than you plan to build the app for. Uh, like for me, that number is like anywhere from honestly, even just 50 to a couple hundred customers anywhere in that like area is amazing. Of course, if I get to a thousand or two thousand, that's great. But again, it's not millions of customers. So there was no point of planning to scale to millions because if I have a million customers, that means I'm doing a billion dollars in revenue a year. I don't think so. Right. <laughs> like I'm not planning to get to that right. point. I don't expect I will. And, if you, so, and if you do yeah. get to that point, you can afford to scale. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when you've got a billion dollars right. in annual recurring revenue, I think you can figure yeah. something out. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Bryce, thanks so much for your time today. Where can people find oh, you? My pleasure. Best is probably Twitter, twitter.com slash Bryce Adams. And then, yeah, just check out Metric. If you want to run a WooCommerce store and you haven't heard of Metric, please like come and try it out because I want to know what you think and I want to know how you've survived this long without at least something like it because I really feel like yeah, it can it can make your life easier, and I, I want to give me the chance to do that. I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, the reason I had you on the show is because I'm such a big fan of the product. So uh, definitely, everybody, <laughs> there'll be it, links man. to a bunch of stuff that we talked about, including Metric, in the show notes, which you can find over at howibuilt.it. So uh, once again, Bryce, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. My pleasure. What a great guy to talk to and the creator of a fantastic and very useful tool. I use Metric every day to track sales, trends, and run reports. And Bryce's advice about engagement and stats are top notch. And thanks again to our sponsors, Pantheon and Creator Courses. Definitely check them out. Both are teaching you all about Gutenberg and WordPress 5.0. For all of the show notes, head over to howibuilt.it slash 88. If you like the show, head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and a review. It really helps people discover us. You can also join the Facebook community over at howibuilt.it slash Facebook. I want to build a strong community for this podcast, and Facebook is the place to do it. Thanks for joining me. Now, before you get out there and build something, I'd love if you stuck around and listened to this preview of Creator Toolkit, a new podcast by me, starting Thursday, August 9th. In the future, if there's a situation where I really, really just want to focus on the content and not about building and managing the platform, I might use Teachable. Uh, or maybe I have this online course uh, system using LearnDash uh, down to such a well-oiled machine that I will use that anyway because it's a lot like a hosted solution. Or maybe in the future there will be a learn dash hosted solution. Uh, but uh, the, the point of that story is that it took me a week uh, to do the self-hosted route. Uh, and I chose that uh, because A, I know what I'm doing. And B, I wanted complete control over everything on my platform. I didn't want to surrender customization or features or even owning the content to Teachable. Uh, so uh, it also actually works out to be a little bit cheaper for me uh, to run the platform self-hosted than Teachable, which I think is 99 bucks a month. Uh, so you're looking at 100 bucks a month, 1200 bucks a year uh, to run your platform on Teachable where you don't have to worry about it at all. So that was just a little preview of my new podcast, Creator Toolkit, which comes out this Thursday, August 9th. If you liked it and you want to subscribe, head over to creatortoolkit.com. It is on all of the major podcasting platforms. So Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Blueberry, all that fun stuff. And there's an RSS feed if uh, you use something like Overcast or Pocket Cast. So thanks so much for listening. And until next time, get out there and build something. <laughs>